Maybe. How many of you here are iOS developers? You need to use them. You can't use the bag. How many of you here are iOS programmers, iOS developers? No? Ben from the hands. <laughs> Not Ben. Three. Uh, how many of you have done hardware programming? Not specific to iOS, any, any hardware programming, C, C++. Okay, so what we are going to uh, see uh, here right now is how to use a Bluetooth hardware device with your iOS app. Okay, so it's 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 a marriage between iOS world and the hardware world. Okay. And for the for the demo I'm going to use a Bluetooth device with me. I hope it works. Uh, and then I have a I have my iOS screen shared as well. So you'll be able to see what is happening on the app right on the screen. So, uh, brief introduction about me, I'm the author of this book, uh, actually a series of books, iOS 5, 6, and 7. Uh, I've been developing iOS apps since iOS 3, which is the iOS 2 or iOS 2, which is the, which is the first version of iOS SDK. And uh, I also conduct training in Singapore classroom training on iOS programming. The agenda for today's talk is, I'll briefly take you through the history of Bluetooth and then talk about the history of Bluetooth on iOS, since which version of iOS uh, we had Bluetooth support and what Bluetooth LE or Bluetooth Smart mean. And then uh, I'll briefly explain how to interact with a Bluetooth device, give you some basics about Bluetooth, which is probably the geek stuff of this talk. And uh, we'll see a demo of how Everything works on iOS using a real Bluetooth device, uh, which is which I'll explain in a short while. And then, to conclude the talk, I'll talk briefly about the future of Bluetooth on iOS. Any questions so far? Okay. So, what is Bluetooth? Bluetooth is a wireless connectivity. Uh, uh, a, a technology that allows you to connect two devices wirelessly. It's not something new, it's been around since 1994 when Bluetooth 1 specification was uh, uh, finalized and then came Bluetooth 2. With Bluetooth 1 wasn't, wasn't that popular, Bluetooth 2 was a bit popular. What made Bluetooth really popular was Bluetooth 2.1 with, with EDR which, uh, which had a better data rate for most of your Bluetooth headsets to work. Okay. That happened sometime in 2001. 2001, you started seeing mobile phones with Bluetooth headsets uh, that let you stream uh, the voice to and from the speaker and microphone between the phone and the Bluetooth headset. Right? Bluetooth 3 uh, supported even higher data rate. Uh, it was predominantly used for transferring files from one phone to another. Right? There was a drawback till uh, Bluetooth 3. And that drawback was power efficiency. Bluetooth was power hungry, right? And uh, there was a reason, uh, the, the, there was a compelling reason why <coughs> Bluetooth 4 was created, which was regardless of data rate, we wanted to move to another, uh, uh, we wanted to introduce something that is less uh, power hungry. And that is the main difference of Bluetooth 4, or Bluetooth LE, compared to the, uh, the rest of Bluetooth. And that Bluetooth 4 specification uh, was finalized sometime in 2010. Okay? So Bluetooth 4 is fairly new, or three, four years ago. But, but right now, within like four years, there are like two billion Bluetooth devices in the world. Two billion in just four years. Right? So that means, it's a lot of devices, and you should know how to work with those devices, right? If you're an iOS app developer, you should know how, uh, and, and if you're interested in uh, accessing hardware devices, you should know how to uh, use Bluetooth on your iOS devices, right? So before iOS 5, which was in 2009 and 2000, early 2010, there was Bluetooth support. As an iOS developer, you can still access 
you, you can still use Bluetooth to do certain things like GameKit, uh, which let you play a game, a two-player game, with two devices without knowing anything about Bluetooth. So Bluetooth is kind of completely abstracted out from you. <coughs> That's how GameKit worked. And then you were also allowed to interact with known profiles. When I say known profiles, it means uh, if you are a music player app, you can play back the music through a Bluetooth speaker. Right? And uh, this is possible because iOS handles all uh, Bluetooth connectivity and all this pairing, etc., etc., on the operating system level. Right? And if you are a sophisticated hardware maker and you want custom uh, Bluetooth support, you will have to ask Apple enter a licensing agreement, which is a very, very cumbersome process than actually implementing or developing the product per se. And this licensing system is called a Zemofy, made for iPod. You know, back then, you had stickers on your Bose sound bars and stuff that had this made for iPod uh, labels, right? But after I was fine, things changed. Why? Because that was the time when Bluetooth 4 was announced. And uh, a new framework called Core Bluetooth the framework was introduced with iOS 5. The best part, you don't need system level pairing. So what is the problem with system level pairing? The problem was system level pairing let the third party app maker or third party code run in kernel level privileges. So a bug in a third party developer's code is going to crash your whole operating system, which means your whole phone. Which is not, uh, which was okay in, in uh, pre-2000 era, Windows 95, Windows 98. But on a mobile phone, it's extremely unacceptable, right? Uh, Bluetooth 5 does not require you to have a system level pairing. So the pairing occurs at the <coughs> application level. Your app pairs with your hardware. And because of this, you don't need uh, MFI licensing, or you don't even have to ask Apple that I'm going to use uh, the iPhone to talk to a hardware device, right? Uh, but Core Bluetooth does not support the older versions of Bluetooth. It works only with Bluetooth 4. Okay? Bluetooth 4 is call, called by various names, which is Bluetooth Low Energy, Bluetooth LE, Bluetooth Smart, Bluetooth whatever. Right? And when you don't need a MFA licensing, it means you can be both an independent software vendor and an independent hardware vendor. You can make hardware like this, uh, sell it separately, and then you can publish uh, an app that talks to that hardware on App Store. Okay. So the initial version of Core Bluetooth Framework uh, allowed you to create Bluetooth apps that talk to a specific hardware, get data from it, and display it or do something meaningful with that data. For example, if I have a Bluetooth smart thermostat in this room, I can read the value of the, uh, uh, I can read the room temperature from that thermostat and display it on the phone, right? And uh, which means if you if you are in a, a home that has like multiple thermostats, as you walk around your home, you will see the temp current temperature of that home whenever you are near a different thermostat, right? So that was possible in Bluetooth, uh, Bluetooth, uh, sorry, in iOS 5 onwards, right? With iOS 6, your app uh, can also publish data that can be uh, used by various other uh, hardware devices or another app. Which means, when I get a notification on, say, Facebook, I can make a Bluetooth app that reads this notification and publishes or broadcasts which can be displayed on any other device. Like, for example, my refrigerator has a fancy screen that displays my Facebook feed, or my Pebble watch uh, that can display my Facebook notifications. This was possible starting with iOS 6, right? So your Bluetooth app acts as a server serving data, and your hardware acts as a device that reads data from this server, right? Another use case is Bluetooth smart access keys, cars like the high-end cars like BMW and Mercedes, you don't even have to carry keys for that car. The key is an app. You open the app, and the car unlocks. 
So it's a public-private key uh, encryption. Uh, the, the app sends the uh, keys over to the car through Bluetooth. The car validates it and unlocks it. Right. iOS 7 introduced iBeacons, which is uh, a way to advertise presence notifications. So devices uh, that are as small as your fingernail, fingernails can start uh, acting as a beacon. What is a beacon? Uh, it's just a device that advertises that this is present here. So based on the content of the advertisement package, you can determine um, metadata about what that beacon is about. For example, uh, let's say I walk into a departmental store like Takashimaya or uh, Metro or something. I have no clue how to navigate through the store, right? Have you ever lost yourself in departmental stores? I believe you would have, right? Usually these are like multi story Your Google Maps or GPS is not going to help, right? But but with iBeacons, if this departmental store has implemented iBeacon technology, you will exactly know where you are, and you will exactly know where you want to go. Okay? And uh, iOS 7 also introduced something called uh, background execution of your app. Like, if, if, if you've done iOS programming, you know that applications cannot run truly in background, like Android or other platforms, right? iOS 7 changed it for Bluetooth capable apps. So you, you, you select options like, my app communicates over Bluetooth and it wants to run, back, run in the background when Bluetooth uh, devices are present near, near me. And there's one more option, if your app is a server that sends data over Bluetooth. Right. So, the geek stuff, Bluetooth follows a client-server architecture. There's no centralized uh, uh, server, but it's peer-to-peer. Uh, the server serves data and the client consumes data. So who is a server? In case of a thermostat, uh, the thermostat is a server. Right? And who is the client? The app that displays your temperature is the client. Right? In case of a car key inside your phone, the phone is the server, which has your keys. It serves your keys to the client, which is the car. Right? In Bluetooth parlance, you don't call it a server and client, you call it as a peripheral and uh, I forgot the name for client, sorry. Central, okay. <coughs> Servers are called as peripherals. Peripherals can be your, your, your uh, thermostats, it can be your glucose monitors, it can be your blood pressure monitors, it can be anything that has data that someone is interested in, right? All those Bluetooth devices you own are peripherals. Your job on top, your Fitbit your uh, various health trackers, they're all Bluetooth smart devices, your heart rate monitor, etc. Clients are called as centrals. Uh, some of the gym equipments can read uh, heart data from your heart rate monitor, right? That is a central. And your app that reads your heart rate data is a central. More geek stuff. So, you, 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 whenever you want to make a, a Bluetooth, whenever you want to communicate with a Bluetooth uh, peripheral, you have to know these following concepts. You should know what is a peripheral, you should know what is a uh, central, right? So the classes in iOS are designed accordingly, okay? A central is modeled using a class called CB Central. CB stands for Core Bluetooth. And it is managed using a class called CB Central Manager. And there's a delegate that tells you what is happening to a specific central, whether it is connected, whether it is turned off, whether it is powering on, etc. That is delegated through the CB Central Manager delegate. Similarly, you have a peripheral called the CB Peripheral. Back in iOS 5, there was no support for uh, peripheral manager or peripheral manager delegates. But with iOS 8, sorry, iOS 6, you have two more classes that let you create peripherals and manage peripherals as well. Okay. So centrals and peripherals. What what does a peripheral do? A peripheral uh, serves you data, right? So it exposes something called services. A heart rate monitor exposes a service called heart rate uh, called heart rate. 
And every service can have something called characteristics. And a, a service is a model using CB service class, and a characteristic is model using CB characteristic class. We'll look at a uh, we'll look at a demo code. You will understand it better if you're a programmer. Examples: What is a peripheral? You fit with job on your heart rate monitors, glucose monitors, T1 sensor type, which I have here, which I'll be using uh, later for the demo. All those thermostats you see lying around, they're all peripherals. What is a service? A service is uh, something that is exposed as a feature by this peripheral. For example, heart rate service. My, my peripheral can say, I can detect heart rate and serve you as a heart rate service. Room temperature service is another service. And what is a characteristic? A characteristic is a character of a service. So for example, heart rate service can have uh, on and off as one of its characteristic. It can have value as one of its characteristic. Okay. When you say on, you actually turn on the service. When you say off, you turn off that service. <laughs> and you can read values of heart rate from by reading the value characteristic of that service, right? So you have peripheral, you have uh, central, and now you have services and then characteristics. Once you know the basic concepts, uh, writing code that works with a Bluetooth device becomes easier. And for the demo, I'll be using this device called TI Sensor Tag. The reason, the only reason I use this device is it's twenty-five dollars, including shipping, international shipping, and. This is not just one single Bluetooth sensor. It has like six or seven sensors in it. It can detect room temperature. It can detect uh, altitude, barometer, pressure sensors, and infrared temperature, etc., etc., etc. You can order it online from ti.com. It has all the following sensors: contactless, contactless IR thermometer, which is what we are going to use for this demo. It has a humidity sensor, gyroscope, accelerometer, barometer, etc. So, how does a Bluetooth device work? This device, when you power it on, starts advertising that it is so and so. And this advertisement is usually done using a UUID, unique ID. Okay? There are certain UUIDs standardized by Bluetooth uh, SIG. Heart rate monitor service is standardized, so it has a 16 bit ID. But this device, uh, exposes certain uh, services which are not standardized. So if you are making one of, a, if you are making a custom hardware and you have a custom service, you will probably use a 128-bit UUID. That can be any UUID generated using any unique identifier tool. Okay. The first thing you do is you connect to a peripheral from your app. After connecting to a peripheral, you ask the peripheral for services it exposes. And once you discover the once you discover services. You discover the characteristics of this of those services, and then you can start reading and writing values from the characteristics. Which is what we're going to do shortly. Uh, the code that I'm going to show is available online. Uh, it's it's an example code from the book uh, I showed a while ago. The complete code to read room temperature service from this device is. About 150 lines of code. Okay, fairly straightforward. You initialize things, check whether your Bluetooth service is turned off, check whether the device supports Bluetooth LE. Most of the modern phone, more modern iOS devices support it. And if the state is powered on, you start scanning for peripherals. That's all. That's the first stage. And what happens is when you start scanning for peripherals, you get a callback called did discover peripheral. Once you discover peripheral, you can connect to that peripheral and uh, using this call. Central manager connect to peripheral, so on so peripheral. Once you connect to a peripheral, you can start discovering services. So this callback uh, will tell you that, OK, I have connected to this peripheral. So the next step is to discover services. You know, it's kind of sequential. Once you start, uh, once you discover services, you get a callback saying, these are the services that 
uh, I found. Okay, I am interested in room temperature service of this device, right? So that room temperature service is identified by this unique ID. How do I know that? Uh, by looking at the documentation provided by this hardware manufacturer. Right? So if it is that ID, start discovering the characteristics. And that is going to call my second callback, which is did discover characteristics for service. I'm interested in these two characteristics. One is the on-off value. I'm going to turn on the, uh, the infrared uh, sensor and then read the value. So this ID here you see is the ID identifier of the characteristic that defines whether the temperature sensor is on or off. The other uh, UUID you see there is the characteristic that tells you the value of the room temperature. Okay. So let's uh, run this app. I'm going to share my screen here, the iPhone screen. Very short and simple app discovering services. It's connecting to the peripheral. I hope it works. <laughs> Okay, room temperature of this room is 22 degrees. So how do, how, do, how do you know it works? Because I can I can make it warmer by blowing into the temperature sensor. And it warms up. It's almost instantaneous, right? Then when I move it out, out, out of my hands, it goes back to the room temperature of 23, 24, something. So that's it, 150 lines of code to to actually read the temperature from this sensor. And this device has like six or seven other sensors as well. You can order one and start playing around with it. This, the complete code is also available for free. Uh, it's the sample code from my book. I have eight more minutes, is it? No, it's not eight minutes. You have eight minutes. Eight minutes, okay. So, any questions so far? Okay, we have come to the last part of the uh, talk, which is the future of Bluetooth on iOS. Some of this is may or may not happen. Uh, first is iBeacons. iBeacons was introduced uh, last year with iOS 7. The goal of Apple uh, was to provide an easier way to navigate indoors, shopping malls, car park lots, Etc. Etc. Like uh, the second one is continuity, which is introduced by Apple in iOS 8 and Yosemite, which was released two days ago. So, what is iBeacon? iBeacon is a proprietary extension developed by Apple on top of Bluetooth Smart. Uh, as of now. I'm, uh, as of now, Android devices don't support iBeacons, though there are hacks to support it. But Apple doesn't officially allow, or Apple doesn't officially publish specifications as to how to use an iBeacon device with other competing platforms. Okay. The best part of iBeacons is if uh, you, you can make devices that act as iBeacons, and these devices don't cost anything more than twenty twenty-five dollars or something, and they send you presence notifications. So. There are devices that are as small as a single coin cell. You can stick it anywhere and then program it saying that this device is present in this location. So if I am uh, if I am an owner of a departmental store, I can stick iBeacons around my store and, uh, do, uh, and create a map that says this beacon is at this location, this beacon is at this location, and then create a map that lets user and navigate through my store easily. Right? Some multi-story departmental store in the US have done it. There are some museums in France, Louvre Museum or something in France that uses iBeacons. So as you move around, you can open your phone, download the app, and see more information about the particular item you are looking at in that museum. Okay. Above all, you can make your iOS device act as a beacon as well. Of course, that will be one of the most expensive beacons you can create. Right? <laughs> So, what is the future of Bluetooth Smart on, uh, uh, moving forward? Well, like with iOS 8, what Apple did is 
they have a new feature called continuity. If you have a Mac and an iPhone, or if you have an iPad and an iPhone, and if these two devices are signed in to the same iCloud account, they, are, they actually are aware of each other's presence. So when you get a phone call on your, on your iPhone, you can actually attend the phone call on your Mac. So the Mac actually relays the phone call from your phone. You can start sending, you can actually send and receive text messages, not iMessages, text messages from your Mac. I can browse a page on Safari on Mac, and then I can continue browsing the same page at the same uh, scroll position on my phone just by swiping the lock screen. All these are possible using a technology called continuity which is built using Bluetooth Smart. And the best part of this uh, is that because it uses Bluetooth, Apple has completely obviated cloud which is boss word now, right? Everyone uses cloud to synchronize your <laughs> devices, right? But Apple, instead of using cloud, they used Bluetooth and creating a mesh network among your devices so that, you know, they don't, uh, they don't inadvertently do any privacy intrusions or something. It's totally, uh, Apple doesn't know what messages you get, what SMS you get, what phone calls you get. But your devices are in sync. And all this happens using Bluetooth Smart. So Apple is kind of bullishly uh, taking Bluetooth 4 and Bluetooth Smart to the next level. Right? So it's not going to die in a uh, couple of years or something. 2010, we had Bluetooth, uh, in the, uh, Bluetooth SIG uh, formalizing the standard, low, low, low power uh, standard, LED standard. Four years later, we had like, 2 billion devices. And every year we are seeing new, completely new things from Apple on this new technology, which means it's going to be useful if you're interested in investing time learning this. That's it for this presentation. Any questions? Okay. And so I'll begin. Is it? Okay, there you go. So does anybody have any Bluetooth or iOS related questions for does the yeah. big phone, if, if the users are in the, if there are multiple users in the proximity of the big phone, uh, does, it, the, does the application, does the beacon know how many users are there? Uh, the beacon is a dumb device. It doesn't know who <laughs> is around you. But the app knows how many beacons are around. The beacon just transmits an advertisement packet, that's it. And because it uses Bluetooth Smart, a beacon can last for like two years with a single coin cell, which means you can stick it to ridiculously hard to reach places as well. Okay, and how does the app know that uh, you are near this location? It reads the advertisement pack uh, packet. Probably there might be some unique identifiers identifying that location. So this sends it to a server saying that, hey, I, I'm near this location. Tell me where I am. And then it tells that you are near uh, female uh, uh, shoes section or whatever, in any department or whatever. So the beacon asset is a dumb device. Okay, no question. Yeah. Uh, in the course of Bluetooth, um, job enough such that these eye beacons can be so economically and um, and so, what sort of battery could they could they use? Most of the Bluetooth 4 uh, device, Bluetooth smart devices uses a coin cell, CR2032 kind of batteries. This one uses a CR2032 or 2025 batteries. These batteries you can get it from uh, uh, Home Fix 7 Eleven for like 2 or $3. They last for like 2 to 3 years, 2 years easily. And Believe me, this, this device does not have a power off button. It continues to transmit regardless of whether it is connected to a central or not. And, and still it lasts for like two years on a single cell. How long has that lasted you right now? I have never changed the cell. I think how I long have you had it for? 
Maybe two years? More than that? More than two yeah. years, okay. You had a question? The, um, the Bluetooth um, beacons, they, they have a proximity measure, don't they? they? They can tell you how close you are to the actual right. beacon. Right, yes. Does, does that device as well? Uh, okay, proximity is actually calculated based on signal strength. So it's more on the software side. The software actually calculates the signal strength and then tell you how far you are from that device. For devices like uh, like thermostat, distance doesn't matter. For beacons, yes. So the iBeacon uh, SDK provided by Apple will tell you how far the beacon is. So that if, if it's dead, if it's uh, dependent on signal strength, that's true. Really yes. On battery, uh, how close your battery is in the light, then, yeah. Uh, Even with that, uh, a, blue, a Bluetooth smart device uses about 15 milliampers of power, milliampere hour or something, 15 milliampere per hour or something, which is quite low compared to previous versions of Bluetooth. And even with all this, most beacons uh, have a battery life of about one, one and a half years or two years. This device I've been using for more than two years, it still works. Any other questions for Mubint? Okay. If not, then thank you so much, Mubint. Thanks. Thank you.